Welcome to a new edition of Through My Lens, a minute perspective of powerful and purposeful living. I'm your host, Karen Jackson. We have a very special guest with us today. We have Melissa Kutcher. She is the VP of Leadership and Development at Your Better Business Bureau. So we thank you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me, Karen. Wonderful. So it's great to have a conversation with you to talk about women and leadership and purpose and success. I wanted to ask you, what are five principles that help you fulfill your purpose and help you achieve success in life? So this is a great question. I recently read the book, The Four Agreements, and unfortunately, I cannot remember the author's first name, but I do remember it's Ruiz is his last name. And The Four Agreements, I had a, it's an, a simple book to read. It's not very big. However, they're very impactful. And that's what I've been attempting to um, live my purpose through those four agreements. One is to be impeccable with your word. And what I like about being impeccable with your word is sometimes what is in your head and what's in your heart isn't necessarily what comes out of your mouth. And so being impeccable is making ensure, ensuring that all of those are in alignment and that really what we're thinking and what we're feeling and what we're saying is really all the same thing. The next one is don't take anything personally. Isn't that hard? It is. I just find it extremely difficult because sometimes things are said um, and and not really it may not have anything to do with you at all and so don't take it personally don't assume anything which again is also extremely difficult because it's so easy to assume uh, bad things about people or to assume that you know I'm a horrible person or whatever those those things are that we say to ourselves so don't assume anything and then the last one is to always do your best and so I've, I find that those four principles from the book the four agreements are great ways to, uh, to live purpose Purposefully. And um, to because you want five, right? I mean, I'm going to add one. Okay. I think he, he almost could have added to be very intentional. So being intentional with our thoughts and what we're doing and what we're saying and ensuring that all of those are in alignment with who we are. And I think that's so important when we talk about, I always think about make your words count. And and a lot of that does have to do is being in alignment with your thoughts because sometimes if you allow, sometimes what you're thinking dictates your words. Sometimes you say things that you might not not of intent really meant to say if you had um, some time. So I have learned to uh, sometimes just take a step back and make sure that my words count because once you say them, you're said. Right. And I think it's so hard because I, I tend to process things and unpack them. Mm-hmm. And so it's not abnormal for me to come back to the person that I just had the conversation with the day before or even hours before and say, you know, I, I continue to unpack that conversation and that I'm not sure that's what I really intended to say. And so can we kind of go back through that again? So even though I think that once the words are said, it's difficult to take them back, but I do believe you can go back and and try to make sure that that it's clear. I agree with you too, because when you talk about being an effective communicator, that really is the key is that it's not so much what you said, but what was your intention? Was it actually what the person heard? Right. Because if the person didn't hear really what you intended, then maybe that piece of communication wasn't as effective as you thought. Right. So they're assuming, right? Absolutely. And if we don't make it clear, we know what assume means. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't want to say that, but yes, we do. Yes. Absolutely. And do you think sometimes um, women tend to maybe process their words in a lot more than men? You know what? I don't know. I've been trying to study this a little bit more. And so my husband, we've been married now for 12 years. Wow. And Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. I would have never thought. <laughs> um, it's interesting because the number of times that he'll say, well, that's not what I meant. Right. And so I, I continue to unpack it. And so it's different for me. And so in our relationship, I do see the difference that, you know, he, he, they talk about how men just have the the one box. So they pull out the one box and that's the thing we think about, they think about. But as a woman, we're constantly processing everything and this connects to this and this mm-hmm. connects to this and then it all connects. Absolutely. And so... I think it is different. And it's funny you say that because I think in in relationships with men and women, I have often been in those kind of conversations where he might have said something and I took it and heard something totally 
different than what his intentions were. And until I readdressed the issue to say, well, you said, and he's like, well, no, I didn't. I said, but in my mind, that's what I heard. So I think that's um, when you talk about being successful and, and being purposeful in what you're doing, I think that's really important to, to do that. And especially be aware of the dynamic that when you're communicating with men and women, it, it can be sometimes different. Mm -hmm. Brene Brown's book, A Rising Strong, have you read it yet? No, I haven't. So in Brene Brown's book, Rising Strong, okay. she talks about um, going back and saying to the person, the story I'm telling myself or the story that's in my head is that this is what you said mm -hmm. and this is how I took it. So could we talk about it? Mm -hmm. What what was meant by that? And it, it it's interesting how, like very much in your uh, example, it wasn't what was meant. Mm -mm. And many times that's not it. But because we all have our own filters, mm -hmm. we hear it differently. And that's so uh, important. So let's talk a little bit about women in leadership. And I think when we talk about um, the small number of women in leadership, I think this whole conversation about words and your intentions and, and emotions and going back and processing, I think is very important. What piece of advice would you give women who may be expiring to a leadership position? I think my number one would be get a mentor, get a coach. And whether those people are within your organization or outside of your organization, the need to have another executive to look towards that can help you maneuver through your career, um, but can also help you maneuver through potential conversations. Mm -hmm. I think there's great value in having that relationship with someone. So whether it's an informal mentor or you're paying a coach, um, but I find it extremely valuable to have someone else to talk to. And it's interesting you mentioned a mentor and a coach. In, in your mind, what is the difference? difference between the two? So to me, a mentor is someone where we are both engaging and learning. Um, you may be in a position at a, at a higher position than I am, but we're still advocating and sponsoring each other and we're talking together more than a coach. Whereas a coach for me is someone that holds me accountable. Mm -hmm. um, my coach is, uh, we kind of go through the, the directions I want to go or, or the um, challenges that I'm having. And then she helps me work through, th through those and then holds me accountable to make sure I'm making adjustments or making changes. Whereas I think a mentor is more informal. Okay, okay. And what piece of advice would you give someone how they would pick a mentor or how would they pick a coach? Well, I think so definitely we'll start with coach because mm -hmm. there, there are quite a few coaches available in our community, very accessible. But you don't always you're not always going to find a coach that you work well with. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's being open to first an interview with the coach and making sure that you do match. And then if you don't, that's okay. And, and moving on to what that next coach might be. A mentor, because it's a little bit more informal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, men mentor informally. They don't ask, right? It just happens. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily always happen for women. And so what I would first say is don't be that person that walks up to another woman an executive and says oh will you be my coach or will you mentor me I think it's more than that you've got to build a relationship you need to get to know the person you need to make sure that there's a match there or even if that executive is interested in mentoring but yeah definitely more informal if there's a woman in your organization that you really look up to 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 ask if there's a woman in the community that you look up to and you have a relationship with them already, ask the question. That's great advice. Now let's talk about for a second, we just talked about women who may be aspiring to leadership. What advice would you give women who are already in that leadership position? What are some things they could do to, you believe in, help women be more successful? And yeah, great questions. We just talked about this for at uh, Women in Business Networking. We were having our leadership team meeting and we were talking about the importance of ensuring that they there's another woman at the table. So if you're already at the table, make sure that when a seat opens up, you're sponsoring a woman to fill that seat. Mm -hmm. or that you're making sure that you are mentoring a woman that could fill that seat and, and make sure that women in the community that you're mentoring or working with or sponsoring, that they know that there's an open position and encourage them to get into the seat. I also think that um, women executives, and I know everyone's challenged with time, but as we continue to climb, and you see this, as women continue to climb the ladder, time becomes less and less. We see them fewer and fewer. They're not out in the community 
be as much. But I think they need to be because the young women, when they don't see that woman in the executive position, they tend to say, well, I don't I don't see me there. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for women to be executive women to be in the community as well. And Time is very important and uh, sometimes it's very limited the more responsibilities and things that you have on your plate. What are a couple of pieces of advice you would give to how to represent in the community more, even with your limited time? That's a great question because I struggle to balance it myself. My my husband goes to bed super early because he gets up crazy early. Uh, we made a decision that I would do two evening events a week. So we keep I keep my calendar pretty limited. I, I'll do two after hours or I'll meet with someone after five only a couple times a week. Um, and I think that there's there's such great value in being in the community and connecting with other people. We can get trapped where we're out every single day and you just can't do it. But I think there's so much value to it, but there's also value to finding balance so that you're with your family or doing things that you need, not need, not need, want to do with your family or friends or coworkers, whatever that looks like. And, and it is because I think when you, the whole question about balancing, how you balance life and family, and, and I think it does come down to, back to what do you value? Mm -hmm. Because I once heard someone say, what you don't value, you, you lose. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for, for us to always be in touch with what do we really value personally, family, and then also in our career, because I think those are the things that help to guide your decisions to give you the balance because I think if you're just like you said getting lost always in the community always doing something and I definitely have been guilty of doing that myself but also having the time to say okay you know like you said I'm gonna take two days a week I'll, I'll use those days as opportunities to give back to be out in the community but then the other times I'm gonna take time to spend with my family and do the things you enjoy because if you don't then you really are not refueling yourself to really be in any help to anyone, including yourself. Agreed. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is balance isn't necessarily that you're doing 50% here and 50% there. Right. And I, I really believe that the balance is very fluid. Mm -hmm. So you know this, you just finished your degree. Absolutely. And so you finish your, you take that time, right? And that's your focus for now. And not that family's not a priority and not that career's not a priority, but that's where the, the bulk of your time is going. And so I think it's, too to remember that it's very fluid mm -hmm. sometimes you're going to be more in family time sometimes you're going to be in more in work sometimes you need more personal time Absolutely. to refuel so um allow yourself to be fluid and i think you made a good point about it's not always 50 percent of here and 25 percent here and 25 percent there it's you know what are your biggest priorities at that point in time because i think that really does dictate you know what you what you need to spend your time on you right. know and yeah. and two, if you're not, if it isn't that right balance, then are you really doing the best job you can in those areas that are very important to you? Yeah, I just read an article on this that if you if you're multitasking, you're not doing very well at anything. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And how many times have I know I've been guilty of saying multitasking, but really being able to take a few moments, whether it's and and I've learned to do that, and really school kind of helped me to do that because you know when you have to write papers and even even though you know I'm a writer I still need that thinking time so that when I am writing I'm fully in that moment you know whether it's taking in 30 minutes and just kind of thinking about what I want to write about and then actually once I'm there actually you know then I'm focusing on writing and I feel more productive mm -hmm. than just sitting there like okay what am I gonna be writing about um, let's talk a little bit about what's your greatest lesson that you have learned from a failure so this is interesting because I think that we're are always learning great lessons right mm -hmm. and we're probably failing if not daily weekly or, or monthly or, or maybe not catching that we're failing and I actually recognized a failure today sure. and what's interesting about it is um, I'm, I am very task orientated I'm a, I'm a process person mm -hmm. and so I manage a team of there are seven of us on this team and I had been very very focused on a project or a couple of projects over this past year and and kept saying my team is they're grounded they're good everybody's good and that gave me the opportunity 
to focus on these projects. What I realized is I uh, forgot about the people. Yeah, so uh, the tasks, you know, get taken care of, the process is all done, but these people missed. Not that necessarily they missed seeing me, but we missed that interaction. We missed the connection. Um, we missed time together. And so the team starts to sort of fall apart. Um, yeah, so I feel like because I was too focused one direction, and you know this, as a leader in an organization, you really need to be taking care of both. And uh, I dropped the ball. If you never fail, how do you ever learn and how you ever grow and achieve, be the best as one of your principles, be the best that you can be if you don't say, okay, I failed, you know, mm-hmm. and, and have the courage to say that. We may not always have the courage to just say that and say, okay, I missed the mark here, mm-hmm. you know, but I think overall the team probably value that more to now let's correct it or, or what can I do differently the next time? Yeah, what are we going to do to fix it? I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give a, your nine-year-old self? Um, some of the research I just recently read said that by the age of nine, they have a really good sense of, of their self. I think to say to my nine-year-old self, you are enough. Do the best that you can and you're enough. Wow. <laughs> well, Melissa Kutcher, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and give us your perspectives on powerful and purposeful living. I'm your host, Karen Jackson, and we'll see you next time.